All right, well, welcome back from lunch. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, special thanks to our sponsors who uh, provided us with food, as well as all the great prizes and giveaways, and the vendor and all that, uh, the venue, and all of that stuff as well. So, uh, our first talk after launch is Will Schroeder, um, also one of the core developers of Veil Project, uh, also the phone installer, and and some other uh, an awesome PowerShell script that uh, does some awesome stuff with Recon. Um, I know all the stuff he's working on, but I won't talk about it because I think he's about to. So uh, with that, here's Will Schroeder. Cool. So this talk is Adventures in Asymmetric Warfare, Fighting the AV Vendors. Um, I'll kind of go over a little bit more what this talk's going to be about, but at a really high level, it's kind of walking through the thought process we had in developing some of the obfuscation and evasion methods in the Bill Aid project. So I'm Will Schrader. I go by the handle HarmJoy. I'm a security researcher and red teamer for the Adaptive Threat Division of Ferris Group. Um, uh, also, one of my co-workers and co bail developer, Chris Spencer, is here. He presented this morning. But our company is based out of Northern Virginia. We do cool, fantastic uh, red teaming. Um, we have get to do security research and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. If anyone needs a job, can talk to me after. I'm a co-founder and co-developer of the Bail Framework. It's uh, our main site, bailframework.com. We presented kind of a, it's been out for about a year and a half, but the big kind of public release was on ShoeCon this year, a talk called AV Evasion with Bail Framework. I also released a second tool, kind of in a, the toolkit, called Bail Village, which is a modular post-exploitation framework. We presented that at DEF CON this year. Uh, Bail Village Post Exploitation 2.0. So I co-wrote Bail Evasion with Chris. I wrote a payload delivery tool called Bail Catapult. I wrote a PowerShell situational awareness tool called Bail PowerView. Wrote Bail Pillage. Um, wrote a PowerShell script called PowerUp, which automates Windows privilege escalation. And I'm an uh, active Cortana PowerShell hacker. So, uh, pretty kind of short TLDR, but uh, I'm going to go over a little bit for the problem space and the, how difficult maybe action is. I'm going to go over kind of how the project started, its, you know, uh, its initial motivations, and how it came about. Chris also covered some of this stuff in a little more detail in his talk this morning. I'm going to go through so several of our approaches, kind of the evolution of our thought process in doing the obfuscation. I'm going to really kind of dive into detail about the obfuscation methods and kind of increasing level of sophistication. And this is going to also result in the release of an entirely new payload language, which is in the development tree right now, and it's going to be version on 15. And I'm going to wrap up with some really kind of short, basic static analysis of some of the payload mechanics. So the whole team problem. Uh, this is as it's a little like uh, computer science theory kind of stuff. But in general, if you have a uh, sorry, let me, let me back up. The whole team problem. It is a way, it's a, I'm doing a terrible job explaining this, so I'm just going to go on. But uh, <laughs> essentially, if you have the input of a potentially malicious program, and if you had a generalized problem statement where the output is true, if that input program would cause a host computer to be compromised and false otherwise, you can build this little nice little halting proof that reduces everything down to this universal halting problem that Turing came up with. Now, after all that nonsense, this is basically what it means. Antivirus detection is an undecidable problem. That means it's provably impossible to design a 100% effective antivirus solution. So even though it's technically impossible to do this, you can make reasonable approximations. So my point here is that detection is very, very, very hard. It's easy for us to kind of throw up you know, our approaches and say, ha, 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 we got around these multi-million dollar corporations. But their task is a nearly insurmountable problem. It's pretty much almost an impossible task. So our problem, though, is virus total. So a few years ago, people started noticing that the uh, stock stagers for Interpreter started getting caught by antivirus solutions. As Chris mentioned, you know, really the big problem is antivirus vendors caught up to pen testing tool sets because they're open source, but they're still doing a poor job of catching professional malware. This is this was taken about a year ago or so. I think there was an issue with presentation. I forget what the detection rate is now. But this is a stock interpreter stager generated by NSFM. So again, antivirus started snarking up more and more of the stock uh, NSF payloads. We started researching kind of really basic ways to keep doing our job. 
the problem here is, you know, if we're on a, a five-day pen test and we set up and tear down time and everything like that, you don't want to burn an entire day trying to roll up a bypass method if we get around something. Um, again, all of our initial efforts drew from prior work. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Uh, I'll call them out here in a second too, but uh, we don't claim to have been into any of this stuff. We have a little bit of initial or kind of original research that we've been developing and releasing, which I'll go over, but everything that started was just drawing from public sources. We wanted to take it and kind of weaponize and automate it in a way where we could just roll stuff up really easily on Cali and have something pop out without having to do, you know, like a second Windows platform with installations and drop everything in and like do all that kind of stuff. So previous work, um, Mark actually had a post for tips for evading ANGARs during pen testing. This is the first public resource to talk about using Python to inject shell code. Like Chris had mentioned this morning, we were thinking, okay, kind of stepping away from that lower level assembly obfuscation kind of thing, if we're using Python where people can wrap it up in PyInstaller, which legitimate projects do, then maybe we can use some of these Python scripts to inject shell code, get our stakers going, um, in a way that kind of you know utilizes PyInstaller as kind of a uh, you know, like a hacker, like a lot of malware does. We end up mostly drawing from Devashish Mandal's execute shell code using Python. This uses a little bit different approach than Mark's. This is, um, so it, they both utilize C types, which is a Python foreign function interface. The idea here is it lets you utilize some of the lower level Windows API functions. Now, this is the first, this one on the bottom is execute shell code using Python. This is the first time I really kind of saw detail this virtual alloc pattern where Use virtual alloc to create a rewrite execute memory page. You copy all your shell code in to that uh, rewritable executable memory page. You create a thread with that, and you wait for that thread to uh, complete execution. So this is a standard pattern. Any language or approach that you can have access to a lower level Windows API, you can use this pattern to inject shell code or build an interpreter stager, which I'll talk about later. Get our solution. We wanted a way to get around antivirus as easily as professional. We don't want to have to roll up uh, on back door every time. We don't want to have multiple environments. We want a single monolithic attack platform. The code base was written by myself, Chris Puncer, and one of our coworkers called Money Shiv. And the whole idea with the Bail framework or Bail Bayesian is we wanted a way to generate payloads in a language and technique and agnostic way. So again, it's kind of like drag and drop. There's a like folders divided by language and approach. You can write your own private stuff and just drop it in. It'll load up into the tree and you can utilize all the compilation stuff, all the common libraries and things like that we have. We also have on our site, bailframework.com, we have like tutorials on writing your own modules, um, integrating bail agent with your own tool sets, all that kind of stuff. And again, there was a ShmooCon presentation this year, AV Evasion with a Bail Framework. I think the, the video's online, the slides are online. So if you want a little more information, kind of on a little bit lower level components of the framework itself, then you can check that stuff out. This is a screenshot of the bail elevation interface. You see all the, you know, the payloads that are loaded. This is actually 2.13. This is in the dev tree now. It's going to be released or merged into master on the 15th. And we have, you know, like all of our common interfaces and stuff like that. So real quick, Couple things are kind of the ethical issues in the release of this project. The disclosure debate is not anything new. You know, we've been talking about for over a decade now the exploit disclosure debate and all these types of things. Um, I initially didn't want to release the project or some of the code bases until you know we had a lot of long, drawn-out arguments saying like, okay, you know, what are the ethics? Is this okay to release this kind of offensive tool set? And the consensus we came to was like, yes, because pen testers are over five years behind the professional malware community. This is a problem that the bad guys have already solved. AV is not a problem for them. It's especially not a problem for any, you know, like APT or more advanced targeted type attackers. So if we want to simulate these types of threats and provide value to a client, then, you know, we felt like having a tool set like this is a legitimate um, kind of component of your arsenal. This is some of the, I love this slide. These are some of the quotes from the public reaction on the Reddit thread. Um, let's see. Surely this will just result in 21 new signatures for all major AVs more back to square one. Isn't our entire field meant to be working toward increasing security rather than handing out fully functioning weapons? Uh, but I really like the, this quote here at the bottom saying, the point here is that anything that helps 
to expose how ineffective AD really is in stopping in even a minimally sophisticated attacker is a good thing. This is uh, Chris Campbell, is actually, he's an obscure tech, he's going to be talking in the blue team room um, after this talk. I put this quote in every single presentation I have now, he's editing it's funny. But uh, he just said, hey, he's like, it's true, having to do all the stuff by hand. I remember having to do it by hand. Um, it was terrible. You would have to have like, you know, your windows and apartments dropping everything in, it was just a giant pain. And then I love the response from Screw Junkie saying, back in my day, I mean, obviously it fits by hand up the whole focus. So, kind of the, the initial steps we took. We started with Python based shellcode injection techniques, and we kind of started branching into other languages, which I'll talk about. One of the first things we realized was that similar payloads are going to be a really easy way for you to get caught by AD, or really easy just to write a static signature. Something like, you know, a straight pre compiled Python shellcode injector where, you know, it injects shellcode through command line or something. It's great, it's really effective, but you can write you just MD5 it. You, know, you can just write really easily an exact static signature for it. So we wanted a way to try to randomize and obfuscate everything so it at least you know, didn't have the same MD5 every time. So the very first kind of pass at some of this obfuscation was, again, let's randomize everything we can. This works better than you would think it would, uh, better than it should. We substitute in random strings for all the variable names, shuffle up everything, you know, and the straight Python script, try to have it be different every time. So this is, I know it's kind of small, but this is like what a typical Python uh, payload would look like now in bail evasion. This is well as produced. So, you know, it just kind of looks like garbage. Um, I realized actually uh, just this past week, I posted to my GitHub some of the original unobfuscated stagers because I realized that people wanted to kind of look at it and see how they worked. This isn't commented, like I don't know what the heck. I know what this is doing because I wrote it, I guess, but like it's hard to particularly understand this stuff. So kind of the next step that we took was we were playing around with some of the encryption mechanisms and things like that, like that to obfuscate. Like what if vendors still find a way to trigger on the actual um, malicious Python script sources? So now we're in real quick, if you don't exactly know how Py installer works, it basically wraps up a self-contained Python environment, takes your script as a resource, like sticks it in there, and then when you run it, it extracts everything you just temporarily and invokes that script. So like, okay. Let's see how far we can take obfuscating a Python script file. So we introduced a little kind of module called Hyperion, which is like a Python encryptor inspired by Hyperion. It encrypts an entire Python file with a random AES key, which is randomized each time. It base 64s it and rolls everything up into a nice little exec wrapper. So every time this is run, even for the same exact input file, it'll generate a completely different <coughs> blob of text. And I'll show you here in a second. This is what you know one of the shellcode injectors looked like first. You now you still have some of the binary data and all that kind of stuff. Like, okay, is there something more we can do with this? And after by hearing, this is what it looks like each time. You just have a couple imports, a little exec, and like a giant blob of text that changes every single time because the keys change every time. So like, okay, that's a we figured that's about as far as we can go with Python application. One of the next things we kind of started our thought process started going down. Was what if vendors are triggering on the raw shell code in the actual decoders, whether in C or in Python? Like, okay, then what if we just eliminated the shell code altogether and build some pure, pure interpreter stagers? What these basically are is that logic from shell code that you get from MSFN. You take that logic and get translated to a higher level language and you get an uh, interpreter stager that does not rely on shell code generated by the framework. They actually aren't that complicated. Uh, Raphael Mudge has some great posts down here. Uh, he open source a exploit loader and he has a blog post about what stage payloads with contestors should know, where he goes into detail kind of explaining this stuff. But real quick, this is how the stager works. You open up the TCP connection back to your, your Metasploit handler, or yeah, uh, uh, Metasploit handler. The handler spits back four raw bytes that indicate the size of the DLL. This is the interpreter DLL itself. This is actually you know, what's running in memory on the machine after you pop it. Spits that back, then it spits back the full actual interpreter DLL. This on the client side, the socket number that it connected back, that's pushed into EDI, and the reason it does this is so you don't have to open up a separate control channel back. It can just use that existing socket. So it pushes that into EDI so the interpreter can actually pop that out. 
I think you can just pass the DLL just like you would with regular shell code, either using more pointer tasking or that virtual alloc pattern I talked about. And then the Turker uh, uses that existing socket connection, starts its SSL negotiation and all that, and then it just goes down. So we started writing a bunch of these stagers in different languages. Um, we have you know Python, Interpreter versus TCP, HTTP and HTTPS. These are actually easier than the TCP stager, where all you do is connect to an HTTP handler. You download a giant blob, which is either a reflectively injectable DLL or shellcode, and then it, you just jump execution to it. So we also have stuff in C. We have a reverse TCP, reverse TCP service, which will work with PSExec. HTTP and HTTP service, which will work with PSSA as well. We have C Sharp, we've got the same TCP, HTTP, HTTPS. PowerShell, we released this, um, I think it was around the death on time frame, uh, released a couple of these peer stagers. And Ruby, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So that was really super basic stuff. It was still reasonably effective in a lot of these cases. But you know, for things like C, just basic variable obfuscation isn't going to work that well. We started thinking, okay, C specifically, because it's a lot easier for AV engines to detect some of the code in it, can we introduce something a little bit more interesting? So our slightly kind of more by using advanced with air quotes, because it's not that advanced. But our C obfuscation involves our interpretation of what we we're calling a method knob. And basically the idea here is, how can you muck up dynamic analysis without affecting the execution of the program? That means nested call functions, you know, like randomized stuff, a whole bunch of processing. The idea is that we thought our approach was throw in enough uh, string processing functions that sufficiently complicate the call tree of the program. This is a very basic version of what malware has been doing for years. It's not that it should be that effective, but it is really, really effective. We just have all these junk processing stuff that the CPU will actually spike just a little bit. So for us, specifically for C, what we do is we choose a whole set of randomized string processing functions your burst, split, you know, all that kind of stuff. We malloc a huge, several thousand strings of randomized links, and then in throughout the code, we'll intersperse these different like nested processing functions all throughout it. This happens in several places. So, you know, maybe the virtual page is allocated, and after that, there's a you know several nested. We look at an either or something, and it just explodes. So this is really, really effective for a lot of the C stagers. And again, those. Uh, we have versions of those stages which will work with stock PSEC. This is just kind of showing you like string generation functions and other things. It's probably just a terrible screenshot, but uh, all this stuff is like randomized out. If you actually look at the C payload module, you'll see everything that's uh, thrown into there. Cool. One of the next things we were thinking was, okay, what did vendors trigger on the Pi installer loader itself? And again, that uh, the exact, exact way how Pi installer works is it has this little exe loader that then it attaches basically like kind of like a zip, zip archive at the end of it. And that little loader runs, it extracts the zip archive from itself, extracts that to disk, invokes the interpreter and all that kind of stuff. So you're like, okay, uh, and this, the reason this actually came about is because that little loader actually enables or it has depth enables whenever you try to run it. So Chris and I were investigating how can we get depth disabled for these payloads? Because if you want to do something like um, deploy corner casting, that will fail if the memory, if the region of memory is not executable. So as we are investigating this, and we put a post out, I think in January, about how to recompile this stuff. We're like, okay, if we can recompile this on the payloads, maybe we can get it recompiling in Cali. That took a little effort and angling, but we figured out how to recompile the Pi installer or the yeah the Pi installer loader every time in Cali. Like, okay, if we're doing that, why not? obfuscate the source as much as we can. So this past May, this past spring, I gave a talk at Eastside Boston called Stone Installer 1.0. This is basically a, it uses like the randomization stuff as well as all the string processing uh, method call nesting stuff that I just talked about. It puts all that into the Pi installer source, and then every time you run this, if you choose the option for Pi installer and mail evasion, it'll generate a obfuscated, unique, Pi installer loader every single time you generate a payload. We integrated this into validation this past May. It's also a standalone tool that's right up there. So, given in each round, obfuscated code for every single source file associated with Pi installer is generated. MinGW32 is used to compile everything up to a new RunW SLO loader, EXE, 
all straight on tally. You don't have to drop us to Windows. Everything's transparent. You don't have to configure anything. The run W is copying into the correct location. Now, randomized Windows icon is chosen for the final package result. There's a blog post to have on phone installer and also the video on the slides for the B-Size Blossom presentation are out if you're interested. So this is kind of like the big thing I guess that I'm really seeing um, at this con or presentation. But since some people started paying attention to the Pine installer binaries, let's try some other languages. We already, you know, we first branched into C with some good obfuscation. C sharp, you can actually use mono on Kali to compile .NET executables uh, that will run on Windows. PowerShell, you start branching that, it's awesome, you can have no disk rights. And Ruby, which I had, uh, so I apologize if there's prior stuff out there about this, but I really couldn't find much. Ruby has a form function interface, just like Python. It's a gem called Win32 API. So this means, because we have access to those lower level functions, we can inject shellcode and we can write native pure interpreter stagers all in Ruby. And it has a, Ruby has its own Pine Solar analog, a gem called Opera, one-click Ruby application. There's the well, Opera that was before. So I was trying to think, like, okay, can we get this all running in Cali? Because again, our philosophy is we want to have a single monolithic attack platform. You don't have to switch back and forth. This is showing the Ruby shellcode injection. You can set up all your uh, virtual alloc, move memory, create thread. You have your shellcode here, and it's pretty easy. Just virtual alloc, memory page, move all the memory there, create the thread, wait for the object to complete, basically wait forever. And this entire thing will inject whatever shell code you want on Ruby. And we have it running on Kali for Opera. So all, uh, the new setup will download all the gems you need. Uh, everything will be set up for availability when you update. Then when you compile a Ruby payload, which I need to push into the dev tree today, uh, it'll run Opera all in the background. You see it's compiling everything up. Um, it compresses everything. It builds out your little exe right here. So all this Ruby stuff, you can, it's pretty much the exact analog of Pine Installer with the, the approaches we have. But now we're going to be releasing the Ruby shellcode inject and Ruby interpreter stager. Again, they're in the dev branch. We'll be merged in the master on our B day for this year, which is actually our one year anniversary. Everything is compiled with self extracting Windows executable. The last, like, kind of, the last kind of cool little thing releasing is. Um, so, because C sharp and db.net code is compiled, it's not interpreted. So, you can't build a kind of little dynamic obfuscator like you can for you know, an, 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 uh, a scriptable language like Python or Ruby. But, .NET has a really interesting little feature called reflection, which is this is taken from the, the Windows documentation stuff. So, you can use reflection to create type instances at runtime and then invoke and access them. This means is, if you have a, a byte array of just raw bytes that are read in .NET executable, you can run the entire executable in memory without touching disk using just three lines. You create little assembly A, little load, and you load up whatever your byte array is. You set the entry point, you create that object, and you basically say, start running this. The cool thing is, you can obfuscate these bytes in any way you want beforehand. You can Base 64 them up, you can encrypt them, you can download them from a secondary location. And then you can, this is essentially kind of like doing that, uh, like the reflective DLL type injection idea, but it's significantly easier using .NET. So we're releasing a, a small kind of simple .NET cryptor called Area. It's a cryptor for all .NET binaries. It was pushed along with the Ruby payloads. It's also a standalone if you want to use that. So a normal payload binary, either you know DB or C sharp or whatever, is generated. It's compiled as normal, and then if you set the crypto to run, it will read in all the raw bytes, will base 64 encode it, and builds a random substitution cipher, so it's not just straight base 64. And then it builds like a little launcher or dropper. There's two options. You can either have it launch that obfuscated version from memory, or you can host it, and then it'll build like a little web dropper. It will go out, download it, and then pull it down and execute it all in memory without touching disk. And again, this is all just using the reflection. This is kind of what it looks like. You have some, uh, a little bit of just the standard logic. This is actually a full .NET binary, it's all memory. It can be any .NET binary you want. Um, but pretty simple. The really cool thing is, which I'll go over here just a little bit, is it changes completely every single time you run it. So it really messes up kind of that .NET CIO compiled stuff inside of it. 
Cool. I'm going to finish up by going over a little bit of analysis of some of the payload families. So SSD is a fuzzy hashing static malware comparison tool. And this is also called context-triggered piecewise, piecewise hashes. And it allows for the comparison of different malware families. From this documentation, it says it can match inputs that have homologies. And this is just a fancy biology term, which is basically a way of saying, how can you measure the shared ancestry of two different bits of information? So it kind of breaks everything. Instead of doing a hash of an entire file, it will like break it down into like little ones, and then kind of do a binary matching between two files of saying, how much of this code base is related between these two binaries. So what I did was, for about three or four of the payload uh, Asian payload families, I generated a thousand samples of each one, and I did runs of SSD over all of them. And what it did was, it basically matched up pairs. Um, uh, it did 1,000 choose two. So it basically did every single pair combination of all the payload modules. So, so say for like Python interpreter versus TCP, 1,000 choose two, so 499,500 possible pairing combinations. Of these for Python, uh, 169,107, or about one third, match a score of 75 or better, and only 66 of them match a score of 90 out of 100 or better for the matching stats. And from one of my kind of a blue team reversing friends, he said the general rule of thumb, at least in his group, is if something matches at 90 or better on this, it's kind of considered a related malware family with a common ancestry. So what's cool with this is already for just even Python, only 0.01% of the sample scores a similar uh, malware family, at least from kind of a really basic static analysis standpoint. Showing you kind of the graph here. This is the distribution. I didn't put in all the zeros because that would have spiked the graph up. Um, so a bunch of them are really not similar, but you know, a chunk kind of are. You see it peak around kind of this matching point. And you see it really kind of trail off. So we get really tight <laughs> randomization. You know, these payloads are different every single time. For C, this is one of the pure C interpreters dangers. We have the same 499,500 possible pairings. 267,387, so about half, matched at a score of 25 or better. So that means half had absolutely like no match at all. They were completely different. And only 0.5% scored at 90 or better. And the average pairwise score was 37. Um, what was the average for that one? Yeah, forgot to mention. The average score for Python was 74. So you see here that even though we have a few more, it's 0.5% instead of 0.01%, a few more that are kind of in that similar power family, we have really good wide variation in a lot of the generation. So it's kind of all over the map. Again, there's a whole bunch kind of spiked up here for zero. But it's uh, not quite as, a, quite as tight of a cluster, so even though you get a little more variation kind of at the top end, this is you know like really good spread for this type of generation. This is my favorite. So C Sharp, using the, it's a shellcode inject module. Um, it's using plant injection, it's using that little area um, dot encryptor. Out of all the pairings, only five pairings of the 499,500 samples, 0.001% match at a score of 25 or better. So these are almost completely different every single time because that stuff randomized, generated, there's a substitution cipher. This means that none of the samples scores a similar malware family. The variation was all over the map. This stuff really different every time. So this is actually the one like I, I like using now, or I will be using a lot more now, because if you get one of these samples, if it gets caught and submit it up, this is a really hard thing to write a static signature for. And I think I went kind of fast, but uh, so to recap, we started out our research kind of out of necessity, but we continue out of curiosity. You know, messing up these AV vendors really isn't that difficult. Um, this stuff is still really, really effective over a year and a half out. Uh, like the Python stuff is still extremely effective even without the phone installer. All our code is open source. AV vendors can see what we're doing. Um, they're still not able to write a perfect signature for it. So we did get a McAfee signature a few months ago. It was actually like Trojan Veil. We put that in our, um, our blog post about a month or two ago on the kind of you know a year in the Veil framework. So we, we were really happy with our own little stag signature. But we, what we kind of take from that is that we're at least you know, catching the attention of some of these vendors, saying like, this stuff isn't hard. Um, if you're doing proper behavioral analysis and detecting you know, like that shell code injection pattern or something like that, that's what we need to move towards. Use static signature detection really is dead. 
There's still ways to stop us. We're not going to go over all those because you know that's not our job. Um, and again, our hashtag ADLOL. Cool. Uh, questions? I can either take them now or hit me up on Twitter. Uh, email me. There's more information about the Bail framework on our Bail framework site. And the goods. This is the Bail framework project. We have a master project that's Bail. If you pull it down, it'll pull down all the components of the Bail framework. Install everything up. Um, we're actually probably going to be rewriting the framework from scratch in the next couple of months. It's going to be Bail 3.0. We're hoping for a, a winter or an early spring release. Those unobfuscated stagers I mentioned, I just pushed those to my personal GitHub this past week. So if you actually are curious in how each of these work or how interpreter loader works, HTTPS or something like that, you can download that stuff. Um, it's fully commented and it's not completely obfuscated. So, well, oh, really, but yeah, questions. Oh yeah, sorry, I've got giveaways too for people that want to ask questions. So, or yes. Do you have any plausible explanation for the gap between malware owners and pit testers? Um. Yes. Uh, so. Sorry. Um, a lot of shops have, have, sorry, okay, the question was, can you explain the gap between malware authors and pen testers? And the thing is, like, so, a lot of pen testers, a lot of people had uh, techniques like this, just no one wanted to, like, burn them by doing them publicly. Like, we're not the first ones to do some kind of framework that does AV evasion. People have had that before. Uh, people just didn't want to be stupid enough to expose all those methods open source to where you know, AD vendors can actually detect what they're doing. Our point of this is beyond just wanting to do our jobs, we want to actually try to push in our own little way forward the detection uh, for AD engines. But I think the explanation of one, they don't open source their methods, and two, there's a lot more money in professional malware than there is in pen testing. So they have a lot of really smart people that only sit there and can figure that stuff out and get paid a lot. I can create these obfuscated payloads mm -hmm. as executables. Mm -hmm. what, um, how can I deliver them via uh, memory corruption attacks and things like that within the existing frameworks and exploitation tools? Of them? As far as memory corruption, I don't. I mean, you uh, for memory corruption, you're just going to use straight normal like shell code, right? Instead of the buffer. Like for this, for us, it's almost more of a post exploitation kind of thing. Or if you need to PS exec to a box or deliver a payload like this through phishing or something like. that. Yes, in the back. Are there any AD vendors that are doing it right? It's already tested. Are there any AD vendors that are doing it right um, for detection? Yes. Uh, Kaspersky, which is basically a Russian botnet. Uh, it's like a rootkit, essentially, <laughs> in their OS. And they send all your samples back to a bunch of servers in Russia. They're really effective. I wouldn't recommend using them, because I don't like all my information potentially going back to Russia without them telling me what they're doing. Um, semantic endpoint protection is also really effective. One of the things they started doing was, if you configure it correctly, is they had this kind of, um, you know, and there's not like a universal exclude folder across the entire enterprise, which never happens. Uh, there, some places have started kind of like crowdsourcing the reputation of executables. What they'll do is, they'll say like, oh, I've never seen this EXE before. So if you have any encrypted EXE, any hack generated EXE, it's going to be brand new. So if they've never seen it before, they'll pop up a little uh, splash screen to the user saying, this is unknown. They won't say good or bad, they'll just say, we don't know what this is, do you want to run this? With that splash screen stuff, that can potentially mess up you know, some of your delivery mechanisms. So that's really effective. Um, if you want to get around that, you can use PowerShell. Or we actually have a method with Python to where it'll extract a like kind of known script Python um, environment to disk, but all those, it, it, you can just kind of do that manually with the zip instead of through Python installer. And all those EXEs and the DLLs are known. They're like known and good. It's just Python. And then you can invoke like Python shotgun injections with the command line, kind of like you would with PowerShell, and that will get around some of the reputation stuff. So there's almost always going to be kind of a way around, but some of the vendors have started to up the game just a little bit. Uh, yes, in the red. Uh, are there any plans to write this in any other languages like Go? Uh, are there any other plans to write any of the languages like Go? Yeah, we're always we're always uh, expanding. We have a large amount of private research and stuff that's already written, and we're just kind of slowly releasing it out. We didn't want to release it all at once. We're also still you know kind of researching and developing it, but we wanted to space it all out so we're not just dropping fifty things at once. We want to kind of incrementally push stuff forward. 
But um, yeah, there's plans for plenty of other languages. If people have ideas, you know, and if you want to submit something, we'd be happy to have a pull request. The one thing that gets tricky is what we're trying to stay away from is stuff where you just generate it and have to compile it on another platform. I'm not saying we won't ever, you know, not do that, but we really like if you can compile everything on Kali, which makes it difficult. You know, it took a while to figure out how to get Opera, Win32, API Gem, and everything installed under Wine on Kali with all the dependencies, and we have to like patch stuff in. Like, it's a little bit of a messy install process, and that's also why there's, you know, like 800 megs of dependencies or something, because if you want to compile .NET or DB on Kali, there's only one option that's mono, which is like 600 megs of dependencies. So we've had people yell at us for the size of the framework install, but there's not really any other option if you still want to be able to, to do this stuff. So. Cool. Isn't that great? Is there a book that I can have for asking this question right now? Uh, there are, there's nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no questions. Sorry, out of books. Anything else? Any other questions? Cool. All right. If you have, if you want to talk to me offline or after, just hit me up. I'll be out there. So. What about for you? Thank you. Thank you. So we got we got about uh, 24 minutes. 24 minutes, and we'll start up again on um, with our next speaker.